Hello, everyone. Welcome to EFA Project Space. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Dylan Gautier. I'm the program director at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts uh, Project Space in Midtown, and we are located on West 39th Street. Um, really excited to be hosting uh, our current exhibition, Cosmic Geometries, curated by Hilma's Ghost, um, Sharmista Ray and Danielle together, and really grateful, um, yes, for everyone for joining us tonight and all of the artists. Um, uh, as well as um, our guests who we'll be hearing from this evening. And uh, we have a great turnout, so we're gonna be just admitting people as they come in here. Um, please do mute yourself when you come into the Zoom room. Um, thank you so much, Danielle and Sharmista, for organizing uh, this incredible exhibition and the programs. Uh, we have a number of programs already archived on our website at um, projectspace-efanyc.org that you can watch um, in your own time. Uh, this video or video from this event will also be archived on that website as well as on the Hilma's Ghost site. And um, we will be also, uh, we're live transcribing everything tonight so you can follow along if you turn on your uh, live transcriptions. Um, so just taking a moment to um, acknowledge the the land that um, EFA Project Space is located on. Um, this is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland and gathering place for many indigenous nations and beings. When the unseated earth breathes again, there will be indigenous lives here as there are now and always have been. It will still be Lenape Hoking. We learn from the bedrock and commit to uplifting, honoring, and listening to those who are seen and unseen, present and future. Um, so tonight, uh, there will be a short Q&A at the conclusion of the program. Uh, you can use the chat to ask questions, make comments, give shout outs. Uh, EFA is an inclusive and affirming envir environment where anti-oppression in all forms, no hate will be tolerated. Please be respectful of everyone. And um, yes, again, this night's program will be um, transcribed. Um, last but not least, uh, I just want to go ahead and thank our staff and board, um, as well as my colleague, uh, program manager, Judy Kira, um, who had so much to do with putting the show together and um, can't be here tonight, um, and all of our advisory council who are listed here, as well as the Andy Warhol uh, Foundation for the Visual Arts, our lead sponsor this year in our um, second year of Bright Futures, our thematic programming at Project Space, as well as LMCC, um, NYC Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, Stavros Niarchos and NIFA. So thank you all so much for enabling this programming um, to happen. We are really grateful again to the Homeless Ghost Collective um, and to all of our guests tonight. Um, the exhibition Cosmic Geometries is on view until February 26th. Um, so please do come and see it in person and we hope we can welcome you uh, Wednesday through Friday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Again, 323 West 39th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues in Midtown Manhattan. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Danielle Together, one of the um, co-curators of this uh, beautiful exhibition, and Danielle will um, take it from here. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and um, I'm Danielle Tegeter. I am um, co-founder of Helma's Ghost. Um, warm, warm welcome to everyone. We are up to incredibly 113 people so it's um just really incredible to um to see everybody we're gonna begin um the way we usually do with helma ghost helma's ghost we have a little bit of an invocation of helma's spirit um and then i will hand it over to um my co-founder let me begin I'm actually, some people are maybe I'm not muted. Okay. Women, Spirits, and Hilma. We are. We are here and ready to connect with you. Might you teach us the lessons we need in this life? Might you show us the best path to live our best selves? Might you be our guide to our humble practice? We are open to your guided messages to create a sense of community and shared support among women and allies. We are open to receiving your abundant signs. 
We are open to your creative energy to infuse our spirits and to replenish us to fullness and warmth. We are open to your channels of prosperity to shower upon us the creative richness our hearts desire. Choose the best way to show yourself to us on this auspicious occasion of our gathering here today. We are willing to embrace it now. I welcome you in the name of love and light, might become one. And so a warm welcome to everyone. I'm gonna hand it over to my co-founder, Sharmista Ray, for a short description of Helma's Ghost. Hello, everybody. Danielle, thank you so much for that um, invocation. Um, I'm Sharmista Ray, and I'm the other half of Hilma's Ghost. Sometimes I'm Hilma, and sometimes I'm the ghost. Um, Danielle and I co-founded Hilma's Ghost, a feminist artist collective, in 2020. Our collective seeks to address existing art historical gaps by cultivating a global network of women non-binary and trans practitioners whose work addresses spirituality. Our inspiration, our inspiration was Hilma of Clint's groundbreaking exhibition at the Guggenheim, which served as a reckoning for art history's blind spots, especially for women artists considered too mystical for the conservative art world. She is our spiritual guardian and guide. Hilma's ghost believes that Western heteropatriarchal societies maintain a false binary between spirituality and science. This bias serves to overlook women artists whose explorations of ancient and pre-modern knowledge systems is a source of personal strength and aesthetic innovation. Following almost two years of the pandemic, Hilma's Ghost acts as a restorative project that uplifts these voices and makes them visible. Since its inception, Hilma's Ghost has run online workshops that have been attended by over a thousand people from all over the world. Our Instagram archive also documents the stories of women artists. We post regularly about our programs and profile living women artists working with aspects of the occult and or spirituality. Last year, Hilma's Ghost created the Abstract Futures Tarot Deck, which holds itself in conversation with the Rider Waite, which is not only the most popular deck in worldly distribution, but was il illustrated by Pamela Coleman Smith, an overlooked woman artist. The project in its entirety, which consisted of five paintings, 78 drawings, and an original tarot deck was presented by Carrie's Secrets Gallery at the Armory Show in September, 2021. This year, we have a number of upcoming projects, including solo shows at Carrie's Secrets Gallery in Chicago and at the Hillstead Museum in Connecticut. So do look out for those exhibitions on our website and Instagram, and I will be posting links um, for our west website, our Instagram, and our tarot deck, um, should you be interested in purchasing that um, in the chat. And with that, I will hand it back. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. And again, so again, great so to great. see so many friends and so many reoccurring faces. So welcome back to the Homa community, um, if you're coming back. and. Um, I'm going to just really encourage everyone to introduce yourself and say where you are and hello um, in the chat. And um, it's really always amazing to see um, everyone from all over the world. Um, and with that, um, tonight, Helma's Ghosts explores um, the deep relationship between abstraction and mysticism as best expressed in the work of Helma of Clint. Um, also a relationship that has remained insufficiently explored in modern and contemporary art. This evening concerns the subject of magic, which as you might realize is not the traditional stage magic. As we know, magic has always played a crucial role in society from the beginnings of civilization entwining art and, and magic. Towards the beginning of modernism, magic was a subject of great interest to artists who arrived at it by exploring theosophy and other spiritual practices, and who believed that through these explorations, they would arrive to core truths that we could express in their work. And tonight we have four amazing panelists. I am going to show just very quick uh, PowerPoint of some images between art and magic. 
Um, and Shermissa, can you pop in the run of show maybe? Or anyone who has it? Um, and let me share the screen here. And hello to everybody. I see you along my, my screen. And again, I'm going to go through this very quickly because we have, um, you know, a big night. I'm trying to get this fully. Hang on one moment. Hmm. There, there we go. Just pull up my notes. So again, just to go through a couple um, images, um, this is a, a very early Lucas von Leiden painting from uh, around 1450. Um, no one fully knows the story of this painting, but it is very much credited um, to be the first painting that shows the use of tarot cards um, or fortune telling. This painting in 1870, artist Robert Bateman um, painted a very unusual scene um, of people, three people pulling uh, mandrakes. And mandrakes have a long history um, in magic. It goes back to um, biblical times um, in 37 to 100 AD. The mandrakes fatal screams and methods to unroop them safely have been around um, since then. They're a key ingredient in witchcraft, um, ointments, and so forth. This is Leonora Carrington, The Garden of Paracelsus, 1957. Um, Paracelsus, a Swiss physician and alchemist. Um, the theory of this painting is the four elements in magical creatures. Um, according to each, the sylphs representing air, the gnomes representing earth, the salamanders representing fire, and the undines representing water. These beautiful drawings, secret Rosicrucian drawings from the 17th century. Um, the Rosicrucians were a worldwide brotherhood claiming to possess esoteric wisdom handed down from ancient times. The name derives from the order symbol, a rose on a cross, which is similar to the family coat of arms of Martin Luther. This book, Thought Forms, a record of clairvoyant investigation was a theos theosophical book by C.W. Leadbeater and Annie Besant, um, an occultant and much, much more. Um, it was originally published in 1901 in London from the standpoint of theosophy. It tells opinions regarding the visualization of thoughts, experiences, emotions, and musics, drawings of the thought forms were performed by John Varley, the grandson of the painter John Varley. The ability of the authors to see the vibrations of ideas, in his opinion, a sort of spiritual synesthesia. This is the very early Mondrian painting. Um, and um, the thought around Mondrian um, which of course, you know, a very logical painter. Um, it has really been suppressed that actually Mondrian really wanted to actually become a minister and through his life and paintings um, wrote that he was controlled by um, and guided by unseen forces. I'm going through this um, pretty quickly. I'm sure very popular. Emma Kunz, with many people here, was born in 1892 in rural Switzerland and considered herself a healer and researcher. 
Um, she discovered the gift of telepathy when she began to treat those in her health and life for health and life issues. Um, and these are a number of drawings that she created in trance through her lifetime. This artist is um, Alice Lofer, um, an artist born in 1932 in Chicago. Um, we are gonna curate a show in the spring in Chicago, um, Shermissa and I, and I'm really looking for more information, but it appears that this artist was part of the Taos group. And I'm gonna show a few other images. Um, really amazing. And this, this uh, is actually a lithograph that is at the Art Institute of Chicago. Not too much information on it, but really intriguing. And again, uh, one of those kind of lost women artists that Helma's Ghost um, does its best to try to resurrect. This is Olga Frappa Koyden, who uh, was another Swiss artist, um, friends with Mondrian um, and a number of other spiritualists. Charmian von Weigland. Um, an American abstract painter, um, also born in Chicago. She studied Theosophy and Tibetan Buddhism. She's having a retrospective actually now in Europe, Rosenfeld Gallery in New York, represent, has her work. This painting is Emile Bistrom, who was one of the Hmong, the first Taos painters to diverge from the academic and highly representational painting style <clears throat> that characterized early Taos school pictures. Um, Taos, along with Raymond Johnson, founded the Transcendental Painting Group based in New Mexico. We could talk much, much more about this, um, but really amazing work. So again, I just encourage you to uh, take a look at those. This is um, moving into a little bit more contemporary work. This is um, Abraham Lowenthal, um, who went to the Art Institute of Chicago, born in 1969. He took an interest in Jewish meditation in the 1980s and in the 90s established himself in Israel, a center of Kabbalistic study. Um, Lowenthal does not say anything about the color of this work, but he does comment on the composition. According to Kabbalistic view, the right column in the painting corresponds with thankfulness and giving, the left column with brokenness, lack and receiving, and the middle column with faith and prayer, and moreover with the harmony between the right and left. It is taught in the Kabbalah that when we reach our truest prayer of the heart, all our brokenness is brought to wholeness in the realization of complete oneness. This is um, a photographer, Jan Sokar. Um, this is an actual image of an exorcism in La Combre, Colombia. And um, basically of an exorcism of a young girl And just to close um, with an Anamendieta image from 1978, um, Silhouetta. And um, by 1978, the Silhouettas gave way to ancient goddess forms carved into rock, shaped from sand or incised by clay beds. So with that, um, again, just a very kind of quick overview of some um, amazing images, I think, really, of, of art and magic for you. Really wonderful. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sharmista, who's going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Danielle. We are super excited to have four really amazing artists here who have, a par have parallel practices in forms of ritual, divination, and magic. 
Um, so the introduction Danielle gave you is just really a historical, um, you know, historical view of what these contemporary artists are doing today. Um, and I will just give short bios of them. We will be sharing longer bios of the artists in the chat and their websites. So if you're interested in their work, um, you can certainly uh, read up more about them. So a short introduction to the four artists and then um, I will hand it over to them. Uh, Melissa Brown is a diviner and painter. Her paintings are the art equivalent of making the Statue of Liberty disappear. Laurel Sparks, our second artist, uses sigils to create magic systems that double as secrets hiding in plain sight. Her woven paintings are dazzling camouflages with talismanic resonances. Our third artist, Mari Molteni, will present several hand-painted groundworks or altars to the sky, which they activate through movement-based ritual and spell work. Issa Carrillo, our fourth artist, will introduce numerology as a practice of everyday life and as part of the research of hidden and enigmatic aspects of the collective unconscious. And with that, I hand it to Melissa Brown um, to share her work with us. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to both of you and to Hilma. Um, okay, I guess I will share my screen. Um, okay. So um, as I was introduced, I am primarily a painter, but um, divination is a big part or has become a big part of my practice. So I've always thought that the fool, I mean, I'm sorry, the magician um, is an excellent model for the idea of being an artist. Um, you're still a fool, but at least you have a table of tricks and tools in front of you, which help you conjure a picture of reality. And the tools in front of the magician represent the four elements and of course, represent um, the four suits in the minor arcana, which is a cup, the pentacles, a wand, um, and a sword. So tools are very important when you're trying to do something difficult, for instance, like being an artist or um, trying to win the lottery. So um, this project that um, happened in 2009 was really my first deep dive in directly incorporating, incorporating divination into my artistic practice. So I was invited to um, be a part of um, Nuit Blanche, which is an all night festival, art festival in Toronto. And the theme, it, since it was just after the stock market, market crash, the theme that year was um, spirituality and finance. And um, I was stationed in a mall in the financial, financial district in Toronto. And I gave a series of lectures which presented techniques that people use for trying to win the lottery. And the techniques ranged from the scientific to the occult. And telekinesis, for instance, um, actually thought forms was an inspiration for this project in using a pink bubble meditation, using the lunar cycle to choose numbers. And during, after each lecture, I would sort of conduct a workshop ritual with the audience with the purpose of choosing a set of numbers. And the instruction was that we would choose a set of numbers as a group and then everyone should go out and play the identical set of numbers. The idea being that we would only be reunited um, if we won the lottery. And um, I really enjoy, or I, I like there's something very exciting to me about the space of performance in the, in the sense that it's an artwork that exists in people's minds after the event. It's very ephemeral in that way. Um, and so in doing this project, um, you know, I studied the div these divination systems and to the best of my ability was, you know, trying to use them to, to win the lottery. And 
Um, who knew that Canada was just as into the lottery as the United States, but apparently. Um, but my two takeaways from this whole project were that practicing divination is really a technology for developing intuition. So what better skill could an artist work really hard to develop but um, personal intuition? Um, and then I also really wanted to continue a practice of mediumship, um, mediumship in the role of being an artist in the sense that um, I am sort of, you know, desire to act as interpreter for desires and interests of viewers or an audience and using the role of mediumship as a way of almost, you know, suppressing ego in a way so that my role is, is more to kind of just read the moment, read what's happening, read what's going on in the world. So tarot is, um, you know, I would consider probably one of the best forms of just building the skill of um, intuition. And, um, and so I read tarot all the time in the studio. And um, I really appreciated uh, Hilma's uh, workshop with Sarah Potter and how she talked about um, how, you know, reading tarot is kind of about developing a balance. And as you read, you, you start to recognize all these correspondences between readings of things that showed up and in the past and in the future. Um, but mostly what I consider tarot is, is a way of allowing me to understand a language to communicate with the unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind is most of your mind. It's, it's the most powerful part of your mind. You, usually, you use only 10% of your conscious mind. You, you use uh, hopefully more than 10%, but 10% of the time you're using your conscious mind and most of the rest of the time you're using your unconscious mind. So it's really one of my aspirations to develop and deepen the communication with the unconscious. Um, and, and using tarot is um, one of the ways that I try and develop that skill. Um, I'm, you know, I know there are so many different types of um, spreads out there, but I am just shamelessly addicted to the past, present, and future spread. Um, I did an exhibition about the spread at Magenta Plains um, in uh, 2016, in which I created these double-sided paintings um, that rotated during the run of the show. Um, and also as part of this exhibition, I developed another uh, divination performance. And this divination performance um, is called um, Bagamancy. And one thing that I uh, also have done, sorry, in terms of developing or using divination is at times I will think about collaging two different divinatory systems. Um, and that collage like forces me to rely on um, the study of the symbols more than it, it, it's sort of like is a way of eliminating distraction. Um, so Bagomancy is, is a collage of an ancient divinato divinatory technique called lithomancy, which is the act of reading stones um, and casting them in a circle. And the stones have astrological symbolism. And this technique actually was used to divine strategy for um, the Tro in the Trojan War. But in Bagomancy, I'm reading um, object contents in my purse. And the objects first need to be charged um, in the performance. And then queries are asked of the audience. And then my bag is spilled out and I use um, the symbolism to, to read, uh, interpretate the quest, interpret the questions. And so this is a performance is part improv comedy, it's part um, actual divination. And in addition, I'm trying to channel um, a grandmother who I've never met as, as a character development. Um, 
So the this can kind of range from being more performative to actually being a private divinatory practice where other people can actually put objects into the circle um, and based on where objects are placed um, I can read the room almost as like a birth chart so it's a technique of reading almost like the birth chart of a moment um, so in this um, version of it, um, I'm not necessarily using my objects, other people that I'm reading for can lay their objects in the circle, and then they can be read. Um, but in terms of the studio, when I'm reading tar tarot in, in the studio, um, a lot of the times I'm asking questions that are also um, performative in the sense of, you know, a question that I typically might ask is, you know, what is needed? What should I embody? What, it, what are the next, um, what are the elements that are missing from this work? Um, who should I perform to make this work? Um, so the kind of performance and embodiment aspect of um, actually performing in public translates also into way that I'm thinking about painting as a performative act. Um, and rarely do the actual readings show up in the paintings, except in, you know, here's an example uh, where a reading actually showed up in the painting. So um, some of the motifs that I use repeatedly, um, I would consider to be, you know, all of my paintings actually are drawn from events in my real life. And so some of the motifs that I repeat, um, one of them is the rear view mirror motif. And this motif to me really represents the idea of the past, present, future spread in the sense that it's one of the only occasions in life where you're seeing your past, pre present and future in front of you. Um, another motif that I think about a lot is, is seeing hands. And I've noticed hands have been occurring a lot in contemporary art lately. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I think that's happening is because we're, you know, holding a power center uh, in the palm of our hand all day. And um, one, one reason why I've actually been interested in the hand as showing up is, is mostly because of lucid dreaming. Um, has anyone ever had a lucid dream? Yes, okay. So, um, you know, what, the way that you induce lucid dreaming is by looking at your hands in a dream. Um, I've, I've managed to have exactly one lucid dream in my lifetime, but you awake from a lucid dream with this feeling, this incredible feeling of, I can control reality with my thoughts. And the feeling fades fast. Um, but of course you can control reality with your thoughts. You absolutely can. And that's like what the whole definition of magic is. Um, so, um, and, I, and I feel like actually carrying a phone around all day and using it as a power set center is almost this kind of collective extension of a lucid dream. Um, so since I'm using the material of my life, um, I'm always looking, I'm not looking for necessarily a moment during which um, was important to me. I'm looking for my unconscious to se select a frame out and um, say, paint this, paint this. You know, it, it's sort of the images that I decide to paint kind of like land on me or or I'll remember them. It's not that I'm trying to recreate something that happened. So um, this one, you know, obviously came from the very beginning of the shutdown and I was spending so much time on Zoom. Um, if I Zoomed with you in, the, in early 2020, you might be in this painting. Um, so one of the ways that, you know, that I'm also approaching making the paintings is with a collage of textures. And this collage of textures includes digitally printed photography 
oil painting, memory, um, airbrush. And, you know, some of these choices are influenced by how I'm doing tarot readings in the studio. So this painting um, was kind of one of the first of a series of what I would call altar paintings. Um, the altar being um, my dresser in the bedroom, in my bedroom. Um, this being an actual printed photograph of my bedroom mirror with a kind of imagined events um, happening on, the, on an altar. Um, but also thinking about the bedroom mirror as this kind of altar of facing the day. Um, and this led actually to a series of paintings that are ritually based. So I, I sort of came to this conclusion at the beginning of, or right before the pandemic actually, that um, I was doing these public performative rituals. Why wouldn't it make sense to design rituals for myself to conduct pro privately as a way of deepening my relationship with my own unconscious mind? Um, and, and that sort of kicked off this series of, of, of ritual paint, ritual based painting. And so um, I'm not a practicing pagan, but I, I, you know, I'm interested in, you know, the design of a ritual as a, as a way of kind of communicating with the unconscious. And so I would never necessarily bring my phone or a camera into this space because that is the exact opposite of what I'm trying to achieve but the paintings can contain a sort of relic of that space because I can, include, I can include elements or memories or fragments or the perception that I might have experienced during that ritual. Um, and of course, they all sort of take place at the same, in the same altar space. Um, so, so really, you know, one of, the, one of the main things that I'm trying to achieve with painting is like looking at the material of everyday kind of mundane life and, and asking my unconscious through intuition to kind of raise a card, you know, help me realize what it is that I should paint and hopefully for some kind of universal um, or archetypal content. And I'm also interested in using the material of paint for its trance inducing qualities. So, um, and this is my last slide. So last two slides. So, um, uh, you know, because I'm combining the digital with the liquid, I'm really thinking um, about how it's a kind of representation of naturalism of our, of our contemporary experience of how the digital and the analog world kind of collide and the effect that I want it to have in paint is, is to sort of like simulate that experience. In that way, I want the paintings not necessarily to be about magic, but to, to be magic in the sense that they create this, this trance, this sensory trance when you look at them. Um, and that is it. Well, thank you so much. Well, we're gonna move we're doing the zoom clap um, <laughs> we're going to move through all the presentations and um and then we'll do some questions at the end Oops. forget who's next who's on my list well, yeah. mm -hmm. and welcome everybody amazing big group here hi laurel yeah. hi everyone Thank you for, uh, Melissa, I love that presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to start with just this word. <laughs> and, um, and I really want to thank Sharmatha and Danielle and Helma's Ghost for including me in this stunning show. Um, and also for inviting me to participate on this art and magic panel. Thank you so much. And also everybody in the audience who has joined us for this discussion. Um, this is a very short lecture that I'm giving. And so I'm going to focus on a small selection of my works that I've made over more than a decade um, where I have been adapting various forms of sigil magic techniques 
Um, and I use that to generate compositions in various ways. So I, that's why I'll be showing um, pieces that span over 10 years. So you can see different ways that um, this practice has played out. Um, as some of you know, sigils are seals. They're used in magic to represent spirits, angels, demons, and various elemental, zodiacal, or planetary forces. Historically, they have been used as magic talismans for scrying, which is loosely defined as gaining visionary insight through a focused trance state. In medieval magic practices of theurgy and Goetia, sigils are glyphs that correspond to the names of 72 angels or demons. This is an image of the 72 demonic seals from the 17th century um, goetic magic book known as the Lesser Key of Solomon. I do not recommend working with these as we have enough demonic energy in the world, but um, the angelic ones have been lost. Um, and I think they look cool. <laughs> the modern uh, technique of sigil magic was developed by early 20th century British artist Austin Osmond Spare, who created sigils out of words to make what he called an alphabet of desire. The basic idea was that a statement of the magician's desire would be converted to a glyph. The ma magician would then purposefully forget the intention so the sigil could bypass the intellect and penetrate the unconscious where it acquires more potency to manifest. Um, this page of sigils that I'm showing is attributed to Austin Osmond's fair. So before making my sigil-based paintings and drawings, I ritually translate written intentions into pictograms. Um, and then the color correspondences are assigned to letters, which then determines various line weaving systems. And this is a work on paper um, that's 23 by 29 inches where I've laid text and pattern scaffolding over these chaotic gestural stains. This is from 2012. The text pattern obscures the words so that they hide in plain sight. And then I set up numerical or spatial rules to determine where this shapes or solid or pattern um, areas land. So there's a lot of um, numerological systems that are going into what happens where. So this is a 36 by 39 inch painting from 2012 titled Black Medicine Music. Often when you see sigils, they have circles or other shapes at specific points on the lines. So here, what I did was made clusters of bells at the line intersections to evoke instrumental sound and the corresponding element of air. So a lot of the slides that I'm showing will have detail shots um, on the right hand side so that you can get a sense of the material range that I work with um, and because they have a lot of tactile quality. So this is a large 66 by 48 inch painting from 2012 titled Break China Laughing. The composition is made up of text that is stacked into an irregular grid with embedded trinkets or spray paint at the line intersections. This one is um, the sibling of the last one. It's another 66 inch tall painting from 2012. And this one is titled As Above, So Below, one of the seven principles from the Kabbalion. Um, and one thing that I was thinking about is alchemical transformation. So um, when two lines intersect, they end up producing a third element. So I usually sort of create a point or a cluster of trinkets at those intersections. 
And then the colors and patterns are often references to dandy plaids or carnivalesque themes. Um, often uh, I'm looking at folk textiles where um, there's combining of really unlikely elements. So this is a installation shot um, from 2018 and it's nine sigil based pieces from a larger body of work that I call magic squares. So I was inspired to start this series years ago after I read uh, the late Gen Genesis Briar Peorage's essay called Magic Squares and Future Beats. That's about Brian Geisen, um, the uh, beat artist, Brian Geisen, beat era artist, Brian Geisen, uh, Magic Square paintings. And Geisen combined Austin Osmond Spares sigil magic with older methods using planetary magic squares and then Geisen would convert words into glyphs and write them backwards and across a square in four cardinal directions as he rotated the painting. So this is a 2018 piece uh, titled Sistina where I adapted Geisen's method by writing words in either um, this one's clockwise, some of the ones that I showed are, are counterclockwise or both directions until the points and lines lock into a composition. All of these paintings are 23 by 23 inches um, and they're all on hand woven strips of canvas. This one's titled Gree Gree um, from the same period and you can, um, if you notice in the slide, the intersections either get cut out or they're assigned an elemental color that um, corresponds with the four cardinal directions. Um, there's also other materials like paper pulp, ash, and trinkets that appear in certain sections based on my ritual systems. This one's titled Dark Matter also from 2015. Um, it's 54 by 54 inches uh, and only uh, sections of this is woven. The other two I showed were they were all hand woven and this just has sections where I've woven the canvas and the rest is um, stretched. Um, and so my sigil system that I developed, I'm writing intentions in a clockwise direction to increase the potency of the words. And I'm using my right hand, which is my dominant hand and the active color of red. Um, this gesture kind of performs a winding of the clock or the waxing of the moon. So it's increasing in, po in potency. And then I also use my non-dominant hand, my left hand and the color blue and the counterclockwise direction with text to ritually weaken the potency of certain words or a statement. And then the two texts are then overlaid and synthesized as this, as kind of a, a ritual working towards equilibrium. You can see some of the materials and weaving and the detail there. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on um, magic square sigils, um, which I work with a lot. Um, this is an image on the left of of one of the seven mathematical squares that correspond to the seven visible planets um, that are found in esoteric philosopher Cornelius Agrippa's 17th century occult manuscripts. So this is an order of six square that corresponds with the sun. And then on the right is a page from my notebook where I've assigned nine color correspondences to the reduced value of all of the numbers. Um, and then um, just sort of a, a note about these is that um, the most common use of these magic squares is to provide a pattern 
on which to construct sigils. They're also called kameas, um, K-A-M-E-A-S. Um, so that's another word for them. Um, so, so they're often used for um, converting names of angels or demons or spirits to, from letters into their numeric value um, through a system called gematria. And then the lines are then traced through the pattern um, that the sequence of number makes on the square. So um, down here where it says intelligence, that's a, a sigil for a, a name that's associated with um, this particular square. Um, so in my work, I'm reducing the numbers to a single value of one through nine, and then I'm assigning the color from the queen scale of the hermetic tree of life. So it's all sort of tied in with esoteric practices. So everything I'm going to show you from here on is work that I've made from 2020 onward. It all got kind of smaller in scale. So this is an 18 by 18 inch piece. Um, so the elemental structure of this is based on the six pointed sigil um, on the solar magic square. So they all have sort of six segments to the weave. Um, and then this one originated at a red square with the value of five. So then the red color courses through the overall pattern and then it commingles with the other five colors. And this uh, sigil originated at the number two, which is gray. And so um, the, the kind of, I call it a drone color, like the color that sort of is, is, is happening throughout all of the different rhythms is um, gray in this one. And so I'm approaching these works as talismanic, talismanic objects more than as traditional paintings. Um, and Rico Gatson, who's also in the Cosmic Geometries show, um, once gave a lecture and referred to his work as paint things. And that's something that really resonated with me because I, I, I think of them as, as like things more than I think of them as image um, or, or sort of paintings per se. And so this is uh, one of the two pieces of mine that's in Cosmic Geometries. It's an 18 by 24 inch woven painting titled Apus. And this is a sigil that's derived from a Latin esoteric text formula that corresponds to the water element. And so that the sigil gets locked into a woven pattern. Um, and then there's black, silver, denim, and ash that that's um, worked into the rhythm of the, the pattern. And those colors are selected based on their lunar qualities. And as you can see over in the right, you see holes that are also filled with metallic colors. Um, so there, there's these kind of different references to water, lunar, and other, um, and other cor color correspondences with- Lauren, um, one minute. Okay. okay. Yeah, I have just a couple more. Sure, great. So this is the earth element from the series titled Pritvi. Um, and this is also in the Cosmic Geometry show. Uh, and the weaving patterns sort of act as dazzle camouflage that both encrypts and reveals the sigil structure. The eye is meant to keep moving, so the compositional hierarchies are constantly interrupted. Um, and also in the edge, the colors that you see around the edges correspond to cardinal directions on a compass. And I just have these last ones or the last three pieces that combine planetary magic squares with text sigils. So this one's Mercury, which is an order of square, uh, order of seven magic square. And it's orange. Um, this one is the Mars. It's 24 by 24 corresponding with red with text laid over it. And this last one is the sun, soul, which is 24 by 24. So just as closing, I, I basically arrive at my text choices, usually by divining a message for viewers using tarot or setting a thematic intention that relates to the forces I'm working with in the image. 
or in the piece, not in the image. Um, overall, this practice enables me to conjure unlikely forms of synthesis. My esoteric systems um, are combined in a way that make the work impossible to decode, but instead to be experienced as entanglements of resonances. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. And I'm just going to say, please come to the show and uh, a lot of other great art. These are really beautiful uh, in real life. So we're going to go to um, Maria Molteni and welcome to everyone signing in. Um, we have two more presentations and then we'll do, we started a little bit late. So we're a little bit um, later and moving along. Maria, you're there. Yes, I was just setting my timer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because I'm not. Um, I'll, I'll set it for 16. I'll give everyone a heads up. So. Very kind. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. All, all the other artists on this panel, and I'm sure in the chat, are incredible. And it's just like really fun to be to be part of this. So thanks for inviting me and showing up. Um, I am going to kind of go in a reverse order than what I normally do, um, partially because I'm not great at squishing things into 15 minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, so let me, I'm going to start with a video. I hope it works out. Okay, there's a chance y'all will see a little box on the side. It's just a technical difficulty. I guess don't worry about it. Can everyone hear me again? Okay. Um, okay, so that video normally goes on for about five minutes. Um, I just wanted to show you a bit of it. Um, and I don't normally read, but again, just to keep us on schedule. Um, I am going to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of chatting with y'all about these works. So I com completed this piece in 2020. Um, a lot of my large scale site specific um, works are on the ground and um, I'll get into how that came about a bit later. 
this groundwork uh, is at the uh, the Momentary in Arkansas. Um, it's a new contemporary art museum that opened during the pandemic, actually. Um, so this groundwork, Venusian or Azacea, or five-seated star, is dedicated to Queen Morgan and Baby Rose. This groundwork is inspired by the history of the momentary site as a formal apple orchard. Venusian rosacea explores the myriad of colors, shapes, and symbols associated with apples. Stretching 50 feet in diameter, the circular composition includes layers of five pointed stars and infinite, infinitely connected braids, referencing the pentagonal shape of an apple's core and the dance of Venus a map of the movement of Venus and Earth around the sun. This work, like most of the, my groundworks, serves as an altar to the sky, as well as a radically horizontal approach to public monuments. For me, the 2020 Venus retrograde, which was from May 13th to June 25th, was particularly significant as it coincided with the COVID era Black Lives Matter uprisings across the globe. During this time, Venus was stationed retrograde in the sign of Gemini for the first time since 2012, which we usually know as the Occupy era. Venus, the planet of values, justice, and relationships, challenged us to review our own codes of ethics and take action in the world to back them up. Venusian Rosacea invites visitors to enter the piece with their minds and bodies, encouraging individual reflection and group responsibility through cycles of power and resistance. This work also references Agnes Martin's Wheel of Life. So I work a lot with Agnes Martin's spirit and ghost um, and have traveled to many of the places that where she spent time. Um, this is a recurring theme in some of my work. So it references Agnes Martin's Wheel of Life. I often return to the, the, this particular passage from The Untroubled Mind, one of her writings, which gives me much inspiration and frustration Nature is the wheel. When you get off the wheel, you're looking out. You stand with your back to the turmoil. Classicists are people that look out with their back to the world. To a detached person, the complication of the involved life is like chaos. If you don't like the chaos, you're a classicist. And if you like it, you're a romanticist. Agnes overcame her lifelong battle with schizophrenia while managing a highly successful art career by exercising visionary classicism and mindfulness. Her mission was to find peace in her own mind. Her paintings sought to provide others with a place to look out and rest. But during moments like a Venus retrograde, I ask myself, can't I do both? Look toward the center and out into space, create spaces for action and for rest. Shouldn't we seek a balance between looking inward and outward? Perhaps like the blooming Taurus, there is no hard line between internal and external. This work is dedicated to Queen Morgan, a trans femme acquaintance of mine and close friend of my assistant, Randy. We learned of Morgan's passing just before the mural was created and continually read about the character Morgan, Queen of Death in Apple mythology. This work is also dedicated to Baby Rose, my firstborn baby niece who entered the world on the day that we started painting. Let's see if I can find, there she is. Rosie shares a birth chart and namesake with the work since roses and apples are both in the Rosacea family. This work stands by the ever blooming spectrum of femme identities and matriarchal muses. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got all of that out because there's a lot of layers um, of meaning in the work. And I'm sure many of you have cut apples in this way, um, like laterally where you see the the five uh, pointed star that is also represented in the map of retrogrades. And, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with astrology, a, a retrograde is when the planet isn't actually moving backwards, but it's almost like two buses passing each other on the highway and the one one's going faster, the other looks like it's moving backwards. That's a bit what's happening. And so these are, uh, whether it's a Mercury retrograde or a Venus retrograde, these are times for review and reassessment. Um, so my assistant and, and great friend Randy and I um, made this piece um, using all kind of analog tools and handmade compasses and stenciling. Um, it was, I really, really wish I'd um, 
documented the process of us actually drawing out this shape, um, the dance of Venus, because we ultimately were dancing around each other like the planet Venus and like the earth um, to create the work. And we were sort of rolling around on these golden <laughs> pillows that Randy brought <laughs> wearing these golden raincoats we had. Um, so the whole, um, even just creating these works is often performative and um, calls the body into the piece. Um, and you know, my the kind of theme of my talk today is it was meant to be astrology and altar uh, building, and I use all kinds of divination as well and other practices and research in my work. But um, I wanted to show you some of the altars that I started building for the pieces. Um, I usually ask permission of the land, um, which is a complicated process when you're working on a commission, um, but I do my best and. Um, for this piece, as we were creating it every morning, we ate an apple and shared it with, um, with the land, with the, the, what we call the core. <laughs> Normally I'm working on courts, but this was a core. Um, and the first day that we arrived um, to the altar we left the night before, there was this beautiful um, grasshopper and one of the apples. So I sort of took that as, a, um, as an omen and permission that what we were doing was, was good. Um, I forgot to include an image in this slideshow that I regret now, but there was a, a beautiful um, dragonfly that landed on another piece I made right in the middle overnight. Um, we had this golden apple bell um, with us while working and every time we made it all the way around, um, you know, anything in the sets of five that we were doing, which were numerous, uh, we would ring the bell and it was partially motivation for ourselves. Um, and also, um, you know, part of the, um, the rhythm and the, like the sort of magic rhythm that we were building with the piece going around and around. Um, we didn't necessarily go clockwise or counterclockwise. We would change it up, but sometimes we were aware of which direction. Um, and I would offer my drawings as well as the apple cores that we were eating um, and drawings on apples as well um, to, the, to the piece every morning um, and then work around that all day. Um, and a big part of the piece, you know, being that right before I started it, there was a death of a friend who, you know, whose chosen name um, related to apple mythology and this idea of death. So Queen Morgan or Morgan Queen of Death. Um, but also, um, I didn't know that my, my baby niece, Rose, I didn't know that that was um, going to be her name. Um, but she was born the day we started the piece, and I had actually just named the piece Venusian Rosaceae, um, partially inspired by the fact that our, um, my grandparents were um, strawberry farmers, and strawberries and roses and apples are all in the Rosaceae family. So it was um, really cool that, that, you know, that her name was so connected to the piece. Um, but every night uh, before she was born, I actually went into my studio and sorry, I'm kind of jumping back and forth a lot, but I hung all of my drawings upside down because Ro uh, Rose or Rosie, as we've been calling her, um, was breech. So um, she was not pointing, you know, the correct or like the, the, the best direction to easily um, birth for my sister to easily birth her. And so, um, you know, it's interesting how the reverse pentagram is often demonized, right, and associated with which craft and um, of course that's ridiculous but um, I thought this was the first time I really thought about the fact that we all come into or many of us come into this world um, upside down in that way and that that is um, the easiest way for um, a parent to birth a, a child so uh, I began turning the stars upside down to try and get Rose to turn to try and, but I didn't know that was her name so to try and get my niece to turn um, and then she was born on the day um, that we started the piece. Um, these are just some more altars that we made um, as we were going. The, the fall equinox um, happened in the middle of the, of the piece being created. Um, so there were a lot of other alignments that were happening. Um, and uh, interestingly, we were executing the piece during a Mars retrograde, which made it more difficult perhaps than if it had been Venus. Um, but typically my work tries to actually sync up um, in real time with what's happening in the sky or at least as close as possible to sort of be a reflection of the above. Um, and then, you know, as you saw in the video, um, we activated the piece, which is, you know, ultimately, ultimately a labyrinth. Um, I called that piece plated or a boros, because if you walk um, the braided knots, which I think of um, representing sort of a femme uh, power, um, if you walk the knots, you eventually get back exactly where you started. So, um, you know, these cycles and rotations are ultimately like an Ouroboros. 
um, here I am laying in the center of the piece. Um, you know, I think of my works as sort of like anti-monuments or horizontal monuments where people um, walk in and out of the piece and become the, um, you know, the main figure of the piece for a temporary amount of time, um, but no one is like standing above someone else um, on a pedestal and it's not static, it doesn't last forever. Maria, two more minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, then I uh, painted a bunch of different shapes, um, uh, like different ways that apple seeds, I mean, this is kind of conceptual, but um, ways that apple seeds might arrange themselves, because as we know, um, every apple is, is a bit different. It's taken quite a lot to sort of control and guide the way apples grow and taste. Um, I'll try and fit this in really quickly. Um, I have a, a big background in sports and was sort of like taught to play basketball by nuns and it's a big part of my the background of my practice and um I make um a lot of work in public spaces um often in collaboration with youth and the community who's using the space um I have some slides at the end we probably won't get to but you're welcome to peek at my website um this is the most recent court um, painting that I've done which is dedicated um it's called a seabird and it's dedicated to um, a piece, I mean, it's dedicated to a former chapel in my neighborhood that has been very quickly gentrifying, a chapel called Our Lady of Good Voyage that I have kind of woven into my personal mythology and cosmology around the idea of like the sea queen or sea goddess, which I call the seabird or siren. Um, I did a lot of performances for about six years in the time that Our Lady of Good Voyage was supposed to be torn down. It was built in the 1950s and as a series in a series of workers chapels that were built for different labor forces throughout Boston where I live. Um, so this was this was for seafarers. And um, I called all the pieces, the sort of like these movement pieces that I was often doing inside of the church as it was being kind of slowly ripped apart and torn down. I call them Ruina Avem Maris, which is Latin for fall of the seabird. But then when um, I was invited to, and I made various altars in different spaces using objects and bricks that I was recasting um, and, and handmade milk paint that I was sort of um, doing spell work around as I made the paint from scratch. Um, the, this court is, is only a block away from the former Our Lady of Good Voyage Chapel and it has the same dimensions as the chapel now that it's torn down. Um, it was actually commissioned by the people who tore the chapel down and um, it has a lot of imagery from the, uh, my rowing. Uh, I'm on a rowing team that actually evolved out of a um, shipwreck life-saving um, ocean rowing team. So a lot of this imagery comes out of um, the dock nearby. This is the ghost of the seabird here. Um, who flies above and she's pointed towards the building. And then there's a secret um, spell and uh, like an anti-gentrification spell written in nautical flags, which I use often um, in the courts. And the it spells a poem that says, bird a sea, wave of grace, brace, brace. And wave of grace is the second line of a sort of nautical Hail Mary that I wrote um, to the seabird. And um, okay, brace, yeah. brace. We're, we're uh, out of time. So okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's a beautiful so, place, actually. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, brace, brace just means uh, when a plane is headed for um, going to crash in the ocean. So um, thank you so much for, for listening and mm -hmm. can't wait for the next, next artist. Thank you so much. And we're posting along with, um, you know, Maria's show and everybody's bio. And again, please follow these artists, not stalking them, but follow them on Instagram and uh, their websites and so forth. So we have uh, one final artist, um, Isa Querillo, who is um, here all the way from Guadalajara. And um, welcome, Isa. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, first of all, thank you, Daniela and Charmista for this invitation. I'm uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, bad of my throat, but I will uh, uh, try to make this. Um, uh, sorry, I don't share it. Um, still. Am I, do you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, okay great. So yes, I just uh, pick up some uh, images from uh, my work. And of course, you are very welcome to, to my uh, website. Uh, there you can find uh, on the, um, also three-dimensional works and installations. The works that I picked uh, for today 
are bi-dimensional works because uh, yes, we have only a few minutes. So um, yes, um, I wanted uh, first to uh, introduce you. So uh, it, it is very nice to hear uh, this language that we share, uh, uh, Melissa, Laurel, Maria, Daniel, Sharmista, and of course, a lot of people that are here joining us. Uh, um, well, my um, for me, I just want to say that uh, there is no uh, dividing line between life and work, art, art. I mean, so uh, yes, I I think that every day I um, I realize and study these things uh, because they are part of this uh, uh, yes, um, uh, creation. So from two thousand six, I began to do palm readings. Uh, and began to do uh, this study of uh, key romancy by reading books and also by reading poems. Uh, and then until 2013, uh, I went out of the closet, let's say, uh, uh, and I began to do these uh, sessions in a, a exhibition that I share in a museum here in Guadalajara. So after this, I began to, um, uh, assume that I was very into these things since I was little. So uh, just uh, these studies have not end uh, till this moment, uh, for, from this moment. And uh, also I um, make these studies of oracles, uh, I Ching, graphology, numerology. The numerology has been uh, something that has been very present since the last uh, five years of my life. And uh, also I'm a student to become a astrologer. And uh, well, just so I just uh, going to put some images. These are based on sacred geometry, but also had to do with, uh, with numbers because numbers are everywhere. Uh, numbers have been uh, significant values and uh, archetypical measurements for ancient civilizations. And for me are also tools for daily life. Uh, that's why I can uh, understand uh, uh, Laurel's, for example, beautiful work that have to do with these uh, magical uh, squares, or uh, yes, or um, or Melissa's tarot, because also tarot comes from the numerology. The numerology is some a study that is it's very very ancient. It's uh, before Pythagoras, but he is the one who who make this. Um, uh, let's say um, the school of this and um, well uh, and also yes with the work of Maria that it's impressive and this these uh, transits of the planets and and um, cycles have to do also with this uh, interconnection of everything and I just want to say that we all have these uh, beautiful patterns marking our hands I mean in our hands, there are our pla the planets, also the archetypes of the numbers, also uh, the archetypes of elements. So it is it is great uh, to meet people as an individual because each individual is its own uh, um, uh, constellation, let's say. And also, well, it's it's amazing. So yes, uh, from uh, two thousand thirteen, I have been a making portraits of uh, those uh, who I find interesting and also my contemporaries, even if they are dead, because I have a lot of contemporaries dead, as, as all of you, of course. I mean, uh, for sure, you have uh, just favorite uh, characters or something. And uh, well, this is a, a image of uh, the rec a recent um, uh, show I had in Switzerland. This is a portrait. Uh, this is this was more a tribute to Emma Kunz, who Danielle mentioned. Uh, she she showed us a very beautiful work of her. Uh, she was um, a healer more than an artist in her life, and uh, I was in the in her museum and in her group that uh, well, it, it had this amazing energy. And uh, I just want to say that I uh, um, knew Emma Kunz at the same time I knew Hilma F. Clint and that was in 2013. And uh, since then I have been making portraits of them. Uh, the first one were, were uh, these um, 
figurative paintings uh, in black and white and yes, uh, very, very uh, mm, yes, uh, figurative. But uh, after that, I began to combine with my studies of numerology. And this is, for example, one of, uh, yes, uh, what, what you can see here is a portrait of, of uh, Emma Kuhn's numerology. Um, this is uh, a tribute for the pendle uh, that is uh, made of wood and uh, also copper. The copper also has to do with Venus because also elements has to do with uh, planets. You know, everything is uh, interconnected. And uh, these are um, uh, also tribute for her sketches. These are uh, embroideries that are made based on the sketches of her great, uh, yes, um, works, or paints, or yes, this mandala, uh, like the, the, the one that Daniel showed us before. These also are uh, portraits of, uh, based of, on her work. And uh, I call them portraits because they have this also resonance, this um, energy that it's like, uh, like um, I don't know how to say, like um, when you meet a person and, and you feel this energy, also you can feel with works. That's what I think when you became uh, to know uh, a piece of, of art or, or, or work, it, it's like a energy sharing between the work and, and you. So yes, that's what I do this uh, tribute. This is um, a beautiful uh, quote, I think it's based on the number, no, numeration, the Mayan numeration or, uh, sorry if you hear a dog, it's my neighbors. Uh, here in Mexico, we are taught when, uh, when we are children, the numbers uh, as Maya, as Mayan, as, as the Mayan culture uh, used to, to make them. And I find it very elegant and also very universal because it's only with dots and lines and also with a cacao seed. And uh, one, for example, is one dot uh two is two dots and uh five is one line so here for example we have the seven which is a line and a two uh an eight which is uh, the line and a three and uh so how that's how we can also figure out how a person can can be uh in um the numerology i have a study and practice and still uh uh, yes, knowing because I, I still study it every day and uh, from many um, different uh, traditions. Uh, he, there's a, a specific um, place for each number and they are constructed by the month, which is in the left, the day of the birth, which is in the center, and the day, uh, the, the year, which is in, in the in the right part, and you reduce this to one digit, as um, Laurel said, uh, when, with with her uh, magical squares, and then you you have to add, you have to add these ones, and you this is called the pinnacle, and this also you have to rest, and this is what we are here to do in in the world i mean to work out which is beyond this part and uh, that's how you can find out a personality of someone uh, also these stages of life which are four in every person also the the mother figure the father figure the tools and also the shadow this uh, here you can find also archetypes this numerology i have been study is called Pythagorean alchemy, al alchemic Jungian numerology. So it has to do with, with uh, Jungian studies also with archetypes and also with symbols. And um, well, this is a, another approach of it. And um, this is, um, I, I forgot to put my, my clock, but uh, we just, I think you can tell me. Um, I'll let this you know. Is a, Thank you. you. You have about four minutes. Great. Uh, okay. This is a portrait of Ilma of Clint, but uh, from the astrological point of view, that's why it has layers as, as people when we met them. 
Uh, this is another portrait I did for her. Uh, and also with uh, the same uh, date of, of this other great artist called Josefa Torra, which was a Spanish one and also was a medium. So yes, yeah, um, they, they shared the same numerology, even if they were born in different dates. And uh, this is a, a, a zoom of this. And uh, this is the last show I have in my gallery. It's still on. And uh, this is a portrait I made uh, like a tribute for numbers from one to nine. I, I didn't, this is the first time I do, I did, um, I do uh, a portrait of, of each number. And this is a progression. And every, every portrait has the, circle a symbol of the unity of the Ouroboros of the greatest of, of all that uh, it's the, the beginning of the nature and uh, also the Vesica Pisces which is this symbol that uh, is the principle of two uh, polarities combined where two impossible things make something possible and give birth and uh, those minutes sorry two minutes Ah, okay. I think uh, I'm going to share my two minutes, maybe because I'm about to finish my presentation. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is the eight, for example, and this is the nine, and um, this is a uh, general view of the exhibition. Uh, what is uh, above uh, in the floor? There are it's like a three-dimensional three, three, three work that uh, have to do with uh, the forms of the of the portraits that are like um, uh, be, uh, getting in life and uh, they also have colors that uh, that uh, have to do with the elements and uh, this basic Pisces uh, forms and the sphere of course and uh, yes and I think that's so, it. So is this a Tiro Blanco? Yes, Tiro yeah. Blanco. Okay, so Tiro Blanco, so if anyone makes it to Guadalajara please stop by, um, great gallery. I really like that gallery. So um, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm gonna finish sharing my, I don't know how to do it. Uh, good. Wonderful, so thank you so much. That was so amazing, everyone amazing. And so um, we do have just a little time to, um, you know, just some questions. And what I'm going to do is um, ask everyone to just go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we can monitor it and ask, but just an amazing um, presentations for all four, so thank you. We have a very nice way of closing too with our artists, women, ancestors that you do not want to leave. Um, because it is what threads us all together here and beyond, so. There was a question earlier in the chat, which I can read. Um, it was a question for the panelists from Leah Nagoyan. Uh, how and when did your magical arts practices emerge? What did you notice that was different about how you worked with these techniques? Um, so anyone who wants to unmute themselves and answer that, please go ahead. Sorry, what's, what's the question again? So to any of the panelists, there was a question uh, from uh, Leah Nagoyan, uh, who is here today, uh, about how did your practices um, emerge and merge, uh, I'm paraphrasing, with your art practice. So when did you start practice, practicing numerology? Um, or when did Melissa start you know, practicing tarot? Um, and Maria, when did you start creating altars to the sky? And Laurel, when did you start you know, using sigils, um, you know, um, both independently and then in your work. So it's just kind of a, a broad question to the panel. So anyone who wants to respond, you can unmute yourself and respond. I could answer quickly because I actually had intended to start my presentation with the first two paintings I ever made. And um, one was a giant number seven on the day I turned seven years old and one was a giant number eight. And both of those paintings look very similar to work I very recently made, but without having them in mind. So I think, um, I think probably for many of us, I don't know if the others agree, but 
we start making this work long before we realize we're or we start making magic or practicing magic long before we know that we are. And there's kind of like phases of our life that we maybe wake up to it and start to more formally research. Um, I hope you can hear me. Was that, was yes, I heard? Yes, we can, yeah. absolutely. Um, I can just quickly say that, um, I, you know, it's a real cumulative uh, exposure. You know, I feel like I first started researching aspects of magic and the occult and then as you research then the obvious question comes up like okay well you're, you're gonna part of research is practice so and then it just it kind of grows and infiltrates and um so i i think that and 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 also i think that it's part of a, an important process is constantly recording or writing down or drawing and then revisiting that because i find that you know the more that i investigate all of divination technologies i realize that you know you look back at something from a year ago and it's like you're already speaking to your future self i mean i notice that happening all the time and and that's really just comes from immersion and you know practice and and like time becomes like a little less linear <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I've started working with sigil magic um, in 2009. Um, as, but I, but before that, I was working with ideas of, of um, conjuring, conjuring entities such as, you know, the idea of conjuring Hilma's ghost. And I was doing this through silhouettes in my work for eight years. And then prior to that, um, my work all had ritual objects and symbolism and all the way back to, you know, my late teens, you know, because I got interested in um, magic through sort of like uh, spell crafts and fetish objects and things like that uh, as a teenager. So it just kind of has been part of my work as long as I've been an artist, essentially. I think, I think it's a great question because, you know, I, I would say one thing about when we develop the panel is that we, you know, there are a lot of artists who make work about magic, you know, obviously, or images. And we really asked um, artists that were actually practitioners in some way of divination or different, you know, different methods. So, um, I mean, that's quite a different thing. And so, you know, it's interesting the intertwining or the research or where it is separate for some artists and then it connects and then it separates again or it connects again, so. There is a quick question in there um, on tarot um, that I guess, I guess I'll answer it. Um, you know, about reading your own tarot and I, I'm gonna say something that um, Sarah Potter um, who we work with closely, who is our, our guiding witch and tarot reader and does, you know, that like, you know, magic is durable and flexible. And I love that. So I would say, yes, read for yourself, read for other people, you know, demystify it for yourself and, and utilize it. Um, so I don't think there's any right or wrong. In our, our last workshop on demystifying the tarot, we talk a lot about that and it's up on our Hilma's Ghost. There's another question um, from Hannah Barrett. Uh, do you ever experience an interruption, disruption or unexpected rupture to your process or system? How do you recover or bounce back or respond? This may be an anecdotal answer. Um, I love questions that sound like riddles. Um, so I'm going to, anyone who wants to respond to that, um, quite an interesting question. Do you ever experience an interruption, disruption, or unexpected rupture to your process or system? And how do you recover from that? I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear what Melissa might say about that, but I, I have a really, uh, I actually build in my systems to rupture. Like I want them to take me to this kind of impasse. And then that that's this point of, um, where I have to make a decision that's sort of out of character with anything I know, you know, and so it's, it's like an opportunity for me to learn something new or to make a decision that's sort of going against the grain 
of whatever the flow is of the ritual. And so I, I actually invite those ruptures and I exploit them. So a lot of the elements in my work that kind of like um, feel like aberrations or departures or sort of moments where things go rogue are actually when the ritual system has like hit something that um, that that doesn't quite fit with the flow of it. And and I'm I can't make that happen, but I get really excited when it does. Um, I can Just definitely on. say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go on, Maria. Oh, and I'm wondering if Melissa wanted to take Laurel's bait as well after that. Oh, here, go ahead. Sorry. No, go for it, Maria. Why don't you? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So I was just going to say, like, just working on these on these massive pieces in public space is just like a wild process. And that's one of the reasons I started making the altars in the first place. I would start by, by burying black tourmaline at the corners of all the courts um, because the possibilities for like weather interruptions, painting in a, you know, painting in 95 degrees. And then the next day it's like the ground is frozen or, you know, um, people walking all over the work. Like sometimes there's like weird violence. I mean, it's just when you're outdoors, anything can happen. And so for that reason, I intentionally don't pre-design the pieces. And a lot of people don't know that because that's not how a lot of like muralists work. Um, and so even though these are like really large scale um, and kind of mathy works, um, they are like like channeled and I have to kind of make um, make um, changes on the spot and kind of make new spells and new altars and write new prayers um, just to see them through in different ways. Um, yeah. Um, I would just quickly add that uh, magic has an incredible sense of humor, at least my relationship to it and I think that most most of the time when you make a terrible mistake, you know, like you know, I'll paint something and it's just a terrible, terrible mistake. More often than not, the mistake will lead me to a new discovery or invention that I would have never discovered without the mistake. So usually a kind of disaster is maybe a sort of magical communication, essentially like a, a leading you in a direction that you would have never otherwise explored. Thank you. We have one question. Thank you, um, everyone. Danielle, did you? Sorry, did you want to say something? Well, I think we should we should do our closing because it's seven forty, and um, you know we've gone over a tiny bit. But I did invite everyone to. Oh, I'm in the other realm. It's very fitting. Um, <laughs> you know, to get a tarot uh, card that you identify with. And tonight's theme is the star. This is our deck. Um, and the star is number 18. We've done four 18 minute um, presentations. Issa could probably fill us in actually <laughs> what, the, what that actually um, adds up to. Um, but we have a nice way of closing. And I just wanna say again, this is a brief intro into these artists practices. So please, uh, take a look. Also stop by Cosmic Geometries. A lot of the artists on here tonight. Um, we curated the exhibition through our tarot deck, through the process, um, we, you know, through the process of divination. Um, that's in, you know, you can find that on our, our Instagram and so forth. So um, again, amazing, amazing presentations, really inspiring. So I just want to thank all our panelists and um, to uh, Dylan Gauthier and the EFA Project Space for hosting us in so many ways, and Carrie Secrets Gallery in Chicago for also hosting us from the very beginning. Um, and we have a nice way of closing with our ancestors. So I'm going to hand it over to my co founder. Yeah, um, thank you, Danielle. I invite you all, if you have a candle close by, to get the candle and light it. And if you uh, would like to close your eyes, uh, for this portion, we are going to be invoking and giving gratitude to our dead women ancestors and our artistic ancestors. Um, we honor your spirit, your agency, the power you have invested in the cause of art. It is because of you that we find our inner strength and we use it purposefully for ourselves and the cause of feminism for generations of women 
non-binary and trans practitioners of all races, ethnicities, and other markings, past, present, and future. We, the guardians of the divine feminine and her eternal spirit, endeavor to smash the patriarchy and build in its place a true and inclusive utopia that can hold and honor us all, our creation, our sense of self, and our spirit for the cause of artistic freedom. Hilma of Klint died 1944, Danderyd, Sweden. Augusta Savage died 1962, New York, New York. Anna Mendieta died 1985, New York, New York. Dora Maar died 1997, Paris, France. Emma Kunz died 1963, Wallstad, Switzerland. Hema Opadhyay died 2015, Mumbai, India. Louise Bourgeois died 2010, New York, New York. Lydia Clark died 1988, Washington, DC. Agnes Martin died 2004, Taos, New Mexico. Teresa Ha Kyung Cha died 1982, New York, New York. You can open your eyes. Excellent. So again, um, thank you everyone. Um, having a little New York moment outside my window. Um, but a wonderful um, night. You can stay for the after party in the Zoom lobby if you want, <laughs> I suppose. But um, everyone else, um, have a good evening. We hope to see you in the exhibition or at our next Homeless Coast program. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much.